Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. You do know that it's 20 days till Christmas and you've come to a financial reporting update, so congratulations to all of you. Uh, a wonderful achievement. My name is Paul Gallagher and I'm an audit partner in the practice. So on behalf of the partners and all of the staff of the BDO, welcome to our update. It's time to stop talking about leases. We've spent a little bit of time, and as an audit partner, I've spent some time whinging about the whole standard. Um, but from a perspective of starting, for those of you who have December end of years, no more talk, it's now time to operationally have your spreadsheets ready, have your documents ready. You are in, uh, in a time to actually apply the standard. So we brought our experts today just to talk to you about that. Some, some uh, operational issues, if the fire starts, run with me. I'll show you how to get out. <laughs> uh, bathrooms down the corridor at the back, uh, you'll find them down there. Uh, we will send you, once the session is over, we'll send you the slides, so you'll, uh, you'll get full slides that uh, both Clark and Anthony are using today. And also, I understand we are taping, so you'll also get a copy of the tape if you want to go back and see what they told you was actually appropriate. So two speakers uh, today, um, many years ago the practice realised if you left all of the changes in the reporting standards and the accounting standards to the audit partners, we were exposed. So we found a Clark Gerald and Clark is responsible in our organisation for all of our clients uh, to ensure that you know what the standards are saying, you know what the new standards are saying and how it is you'll be able to uh, comply with those. Of course, we didn't want just that person. We needed some uh, audit expertise to ensure that whatever he told you was actually able to be applied. So hence, we've got Anthony White with us here today, and Anthony is one of our very senior and intelligent audit partners. So whatever Clark tells you, Anthony will then help you apply uh, the common sense approach to it. So again, welcome. Uh, after we finish, uh, we will invite you to go back out into our foyer and we'll have some more uh, drinks and savouries to celebrate the, uh, the start of the Christmas period. So let me introduce Clark and Anthony to you. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, today's session is just about leases and I'll be 16. Um, and um, so uh, you're all familiar with the major changes in financial reporting over the last couple of years. So uh, we've had uh, that was the nine financial instruments and the new revenue standard. I assume you've all uh, adopted those as of June uh, this year or last December, whichever your reporting date is. Um, and we're now about to uh, um, adopt the uh, lease standard. So these are, some people refer to these as the triple threat standards, three major changes in financial reporting. Um, so we're about to uh, do the last one of them, leases, which in some instances will be um, the biggest uh, impact of all, of all for uh, quite a few entities. As you can see there, if you're a December balance date, it'll be December this year. So we're in December right now. So um, if you've got leases, um, you should be dealing with this uh, standard You've got a June balance date, you've got a little bit more time, unless you've got half the reporting requirements, which um, you'll be dealing with for half the year as well, um, in December. So uh, it is upon us. We're just going to, this is just a very high level, we're just going to cover um, and look at the uh, issues of recognition and transition today. At a high level, this standard is, is um, similar in scope to the old lease standard, LS 117, and it deals with leases. It has significant changes, however, for lessees, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today. Some comments on lessors towards the end. Um, at a very high level, uh, the change for lessees is uh, that most leases will be recognised on balance sheet. We no longer have the dual model of offering leases and finance leases for lessees. We still do have that for the source. So it hasn't totally gone out of the uh, standard, uh, classification issues of operating finances. Transition, as we just mentioned a moment ago, is 1 January 19, so we're in, we're uh, well past that date now. And we'll look at some of the transition issues. There's a number of different ways to transition to this standard. So we'll, we'll touch on that too today. And some of the pros and cons of the different transition methods. Um, so you will have to make a choice of how you transition. Present and cons 
uh, hopefully will give you some insight as to uh, as to the things to think about in you know, assessing which way you have to transition to this new standard. As that slide says, the uh, key issue on this standard is it's the end of the road for operating leases for lessees. Not for lessors, but for lessees. We no longer have a dual model. We have a single lessee account model whereby virtually all leases will be on balance sheet. There are some exceptions, and we'll touch on those during the presentation, but virtually all leases for lessees will be on balance sheet. <coughs> Just in terms of the main changes um, in, to current practice for the old LC117, um, no operating lease, I've already touched on that. The change to the new standard will mean that we're going to have straight lining, or the straight lining, sorry, of, of rental expenses disappears. And what happens with that is that we have front loading expenses. I'll show you an example of that shortly. So the, the expense profile of your leases as we see changes. All leases on balance sheet, so we'll have a right of use asset and a lease liability. Of course, the lease liability is to be split between current and non current. Um, someone here, one of my colleagues, asked me, Oh, does that mean we can split the right of use asset between current and non current? No, we can't do that. Um, so there's an effect on uh, current ratio, a negative effect, obviously. There's an issue in the standard as to which payments get capitalised. Now, not all these payments will be capitalised into the right of use asset and lease liability. And that's important to understand. Fixed payments are index linked payments. We've got variable payments that are uh, linked to an index or a rate, including market rates. They are capitalised. But other variable payments aren't. So they're expensed as you go. Another um, issue in terms of what capitalises is the treatment of option periods. So this standard is quite different to the old leasing standard 117. Uh, it dealt with motor vehicle leases where we didn't have all the complications of option periods, uh, CPI adjustments, market rent reviews and such like. This standard is quite different. It deals with all those and therefore it's a much more complicated standard than the old lease standard. So it deals with option periods in leases, and you have to include those option periods in the lease term in certain cases, and we'll touch on that today as well. If you, of course, if you include the option period in the lease term, that means you're going to have a higher right of use asset and a higher lease liability. So it's important to consider option periods properly. What are some of the effects on your ratios and key performance measures? Well, as I've already uh, mentioned, there's a front loading of expenses. The interest expense is, is higher in the early, earlier years of the lease, lower in the later years. And that's because the lease liability declines. Interest rate, the rate, which I can say the same, but the liability declines, and therefore the interest expense declines. So there's a front loading of interest expense, which means that the expense profile is pushed forward compared to the old standard, which you, if you comply with it, Theoretically, you would have been uh, um, straight lining the rental expense. EBITDA um, changes under this new standard. We have, um, uh, we have um, in the past, the rental expenses were above the EBITDA line. Under this new standard, of course, rental expenses go away. So the, that line item increases, EBITDA increases. The expenses are now down in interest and depreciation down below the EBITDA line. Now some people use EBITDA as a key performance measure, so there will be a significant impact there. Balance sheet ratios change. Because you've got an increase in assets and increase in liabilities, that can affect the gearing. And in particular, as I mentioned, you'll have a current liability change, no current assets, so that affects your current ratio. So the balance sheet ratio has changed, that leads to issues about bank covenants. You should be, if you have these leases are significant in terms of your balance sheet or in terms of financial statements, you should be looking and considering what's the effect on your bank covenants because it may be negative in terms of you might find that your covenants were 
you know, established under the old standard, once you implement this new standard, and uh, and then you, the, the numbers come out, it may be that you've got a breach of your event covenants, which might be adverse. So you might be wanting to model these changes and talking to your financiers to deal with any advert, possible adverse impacts of bank covenants. Then there can be flow on effects to other things like other cost related contracts, performance bonuses. So the performance bonuses are based on that, for example, they could be impacted, or even the ability to pay dividends and the dividend policy. So just a simple example uh, to show how this uh, um, standard actually impacts on numbers. So we're just assuming uh, we've got an administration building with these lease payments um, for three years and the borrowing rate, which will be the discount rate of 10%. Nice simple assumption. In the past, that would have been assessed as an operating lease policy. Under um, the new standard, of course, we don't have to make that assessment. It, it won't meet the exceptions to not capitalise, which we'll touch on shortly. So we have to capitalise this, uh, this, this lease. So you can see here, three year lease, what's the effect of this? We've got, um, under the old standard, 117, I'm now calling it that old, because um, we're in 2019 under Doc 16 you would have straight line the uh, rental expense of, uh, and that would have been $72,000 per annum. Under the new standard, that would have been up in Expense above the EBITDA line, as I mentioned earlier. Under the new standard, um, in this simple scenario, we have an amortization expense of just under $62,000 a year, um, and that's assuming straight line. And we have interest expense, which is coming down as the lease liability declines. So you can see in this simple example how the expense profile changes. Higher and earlier in the life of the lease, lower than straight line in the latter part of the life. If you multiply this by many leases, you can see how this could have a significant impact. In terms of the balance sheet, under the old standard, you had nothing. Of course, you might have had a straight line of accrual, but um, essentially you had no, no right use asset, no lease liability. Under the new standard, obviously we have a, a right use asset which declines over time as you depreciate it the end of the lease term where we have nothing. We have a lease liability split between current and non-current, as I've already mentioned. And you can see in this example, there's a negative impact on net assets, which will typically be the case. Because typically the lease liabilities will be greater than the right of use asset. I can't say always, but typically. So typically we'll have a negative impact on net assets, which could impact their ability to pay dividends. Because under the Corporations Act, you have to have regard to net assets to pay the dividends. It also impacts the outstanding cash flows. Even though the total cash flows each year are the same, where those cash flows show up in your statement cash flows will be different. Under the old standard, the uh, rental expenses would have been shown up in operating cash flows. Now, under the new standard, the expenses or the cash flows will be split between financing and uh, interest expense and repayment of principal. So the repayment of principal would be down in financing cash flows. Of course, the interest expense could be in either financing or operating, so an entity by entity choice, the standard allows. But clearly, what this shows is that operating cash flows will be higher. Some people um, will like that. Now, I did mention earlier that there are a couple of uh, exemptions or recognition exemptions. Two items. There's, we don't have to capitalise these, and uh, we can just simply adopt the old account as a straight line expense for these types of items. And two items are low value items. And the standard itself doesn't tell us uh, what the value is, but if you go into the basic conclusions to the standard, it gives. Um, some comment that the standard says of thinking about items that have a value when new of less than five thousand dollars US. So I guess that might be seven thousand dollars or something like that Australian. Australian 
Jandra. In the Queensland public sector, Treasury, there's a Treasury paper which suggests that everyone there views less than $10,000. It's low value. Yes, sir. The other exception is uh, short term leases, leases of less than 12 months, including extension options. So if you meet either of these exceptions, you can simply <coughs> expense the payments over the lease term, over, uh, over the uh, over period on a uh, straight line basis, and you don't have to capitalise them. You need to be careful in the low value items uh, um, example. What, what are we talking about on that? Talking about things like laptops, um, mobile phones, small items of furniture, those sort of things. Standard actually comments on those, those as examples of low value items. There are anti avoidance measures in the standard, so that you can't uh, split an item up into a whole heap of components and claim that item is uh, low value. An example I sometimes use is if you can't take a car and lease separately the wheels and the engine and the seats and the body and get, get less than $5,000 US. There's an any words measure which uh, means you can't do that. So there's two exceptions there which is a matter of choice. Reach out. So what if you had a lease to rent say 100 laptops? Um, if it's a lease, so if each laptop meets the definition of a low AI, mm. say so less yeah. than five thousand US, and it's at least a hundred of them, that would still be you'd still be able to use the exception yeah. because it stands written on the basis of at least an individual item. Yeah. <coughs> um, so just a couple of comments on those exceptions. The uh, the short term lease applies um, on a class one away asset. Whereas the low value item uh, exception applies was made on a lease by lease basis, and this, these comments here are about the uh, about the energy board measures. I've already said the assessment for low value items is when they're new, so you don't you don't if you're, if you're leasing an item that's not new, um, it's not the value now; it's the value of the item that's new. So that's, uh, that's the exceptions. Now one of the key issues you're going to have to deal with this year, and this is really a, an issue this year, it's not an ongoing issue, is how you transition to WC16. This is a key issue for your financial reporting this year. That we all have to deal with. Now the standard gives us a number of choices. So we can adopt what's called the full retrospective approach. What that means effectively is we go back and apply the standard as if we've all, as if we've always been applying. We adjust the comparatives and do the calculations as if we've always applied the standard. Then there's what's called the modified retrospective approach, but within that there's actually two choices. Now under under the modified approach, you don't change the comparatives. The comparatives for last year stay the same. You make the adjustments as at you know, June advance that any one of the items that you put the, whatever, whatever adjustments go there are in, go through and retain that at that date. Paris that so. Under modified approach, or we're calling the modified approach number one here, you, you calculate your lease liability, which is the future lease payments as at as June advance that one July 19th, you calculate the lease liability based on those future payments as at that date for each lease at your incremental buying rate. You don't know the interest rate, just please. I think it's equal to buying it anyway. And you set the right of use asset equal to that amount. Now, what you do to that value then is you adjust it for any uh, straight line rental accruals or lease incentives that you might have in the balance sheet in respect of that lease. So that at the end of the day, there's no adjustment to open retained earnings. What we're calling modified approach number two, you calculate your lease liability exactly the same way. So future payments from the trend, uh, um, date of uh, initial application, future lease payments from that date, discounted incremental buying rate. So that that that's that number stays the same as the first approach. What's different under the other approach though, or the second approach though, is that the 
the right of use asset is calculated differently. You calculate that as if you've always applied the standard, but in doing that, there's some practical expedients you can adopt. And we'll touch on those shortly. It simplifies the calculation of the right of use asset. It'll end up being a different number to the number under my filtration number one. Now, these approaches here we're talking about are for what you call operating leases in the past. For finance leases, the numbers will be what you had in the past for that initial application. Another way of looking at it is you've got a full retrospective approach, changing parity, cumulative effect is adjusting its own retained earnings at the beginning of the comparative year. You'll have a third state of financial position because of the change, and you've got very limited transitional relief. You've got to go, you don't get to apply for a lot of the practical expedients which are available under the modified approach. Under this approach, you don't change the parity, put the adjustments, if any, through on one to I on end, June, June balance date, no third statement, and as I said, these two approaches with, with practical expedients available. So just talking about those practical expedients. Now this one's available under all approaches and uh, it's quite handy. And under this first practical expedient, you don't have to go back and open up what is what you've assessed as a lease at the date of the future location. If you've assessed it an item, a lease or a contract to be a lease under the old standard, you can treat it as a lease under the new standard on the date of the location. And if you assess the contract is not a lease under the old standard, you don't have to reassess it at that date. That makes life a bit simpler. Going forward, you apply the definition in the new standard, the definition of the lease in the new standard to determine whether or not the other lease. So that simplifies life a bit, a fair bit in some cases on the date of initial application. And that's available under all methods that practical speed. Now there's a number of other practical expedients which are only available under the modified methods, not available under the uh, full retrospective method. I won't go through the detail on all of them, I'll just comment on a couple of them. One of the uh, practical expedients, for example, is that you don't have to go back under modified number two and calculate the, or determine the initial direct cost of entering into each lease, which you do under the full method, you don't have to go back and, cap and assess the initial direct cost of the right use asset for each lease and add it into the, into the current value of the right use asset. That simplifies life a lot. Another um, practical expedient is that for leases that the lease term ends within 12 months of um, initial application, so within 12 months of 1 July 19, for example, for those leases, you can uh, use the practical speed of not having to put them on the balance sheet. Treat them effectively as short term leases. Again, that's not available under the full retrospective method. And there's a couple of other practical speeds there too, uh, as you can see. So, another way of looking at that is that under the full method, you've only got one practical speed, that's the first one, which as I said, is the definition of lease on the date of initial application. You've got, under the other methods, all those practical experience are available, and they do simplify life in some cases. Now, we've put together a slide there which shows the pros and cons for each of the, uh, for our assessment, of the pros and cons for each of the uh, approaches to transitioning to this new standard. So under the full retrospective approach, one of the pros is greater comparability, because obviously if, if the numbers for the parity year and the current year will be comparable on a comparable basis. Whereas under the other conservative methods, they're not, then you don't change the parities. The cons of the full retrospective approach are there's a lot more effort required, more significant, significant more cost in some cases. And also, is the data available? If you've got leases that go back quite some years, is the data available to, cap to capture that data and do all the calculations you need to do to comply with that full retrospective approach? 
You could also have some negative impacts on covenants if your drug use asset is going to be significantly less than your list liabilities. Under the modified approach, the, under the simpler of the approaches, where you set the drug use asset equal to the list liability, essentially, obviously the pros there are it's much simpler, there's less cost. There's no change in net assets on transition, which uh, uh, minimises the risks of um, adverse effects on uh, on uh, on covenants, etc. There still may be some issues because your gearing ratio is going to change. You're talking about asset liabilities and amounts, so, but it's still um, less uh, maybe less an issue than other approaches. The cons of that approach: first one is comparability in year one, of course. But maybe the major con of that method of that choice is that there will be higher post-transition expenses as compared to other choices. Now the reason for that is because you set the right of use asset equal to the lease liability, in the future you've got to depreciate that right of use asset. So it'll be you've got to depreciate all of that amount. Under the other two approaches, the right of use asset will typically be less than the lease liability, so there will be typically less depreciation charges in the future than as compared to this method. So that method does have a, even though it's much simpler, it, there is an issue there around higher post-transition expenses, and some people won't like that. Clark, would that statement that the right of use asset typically be less than the lease liability. Is that where you tend to have older leases as opposed to newer leases? Um, well, if the lease is very new as a, as yeah. a transition, then it, won't be, it may not be such a difference. Yeah. Um, but it all widens up um, uh, for a period of time because of the depreciation and etc. Yeah. So it dep depends on the profile where you're at. Modified approach number two, um, as compared to the full retrospective approach, the, the pros for that are that you've got practical experience about it. The cons are, again, comparability. There is significantly more effort required in that as compared to modified number one. Therefore, cost, data availability too, because you're going back and calculating the right of this asset as if you're always applied to standards. So a couple of practical experience do minimise that. For example, you don't have to go back and uh, assess the initial rent costs. You also use the incremental borrowing rate as a state of transition rather than historical rate, which you may, may not be able to assess. So um, you're more likely to be able to get data for that one than that one. So that's a high-level overview of the pros and cons of the different uh, transition methods. In some cases, you'll be able to make an assessment of how to transition just on a qualitative basis. Some of you will need and will want to run uh, the numbers to determine the effects of transition, and we've seen some clients do that. But we've also got various clients that just make an assessment of the transition method based on a qualitative basis. Now, for example, some say, well, we'll use a doctor doc modified approach. We don't ever data goes up under all these methods. That's how we're assessed. We're not too worried about the depreciation. Not every approach is like that, of course. So that's transition. That's, that's this year a major decision that you'll have to uh, consider. Now, I talked about the definition of lease earlier. Um, I mentioned that uh, under the first practical expedient, you don't have to worry about that on transition. You have to worry about it though post transition. Now there's a new definition of our list in this standard. It tells us a list is a contract or part of a contract. So it doesn't have to be the whole contract. It conveys the right to use it as an asset for a period of time exchange consideration. Nice simple definition, but a few issues come from that. So um, another way of looking at this um, in, in assessing whether or not we've got a lease um, in, um, under the standard is We've broken it up into three issues that need to be considered. This, this is what the standard kind of tells us we need to consider. If you fail any of those, you don't have a lease. So, you need to 
just see it as an identified asset. That's the first thing. Um, and we'll look at uh, the issue of, um, uh, of that in a moment. You need to consider whether the LLC contains substantially all the economic benefits from that identified asset. And thirdly, you need to determine whether the LLC has the right to direct the use of that identified asset. If the answer to all those questions is yes, then the contract contains a lease. Don't say we haven't said the contract is a lease because um, the contract may have other components within it. The, the definition, as you saw, a lease is a contract as part of the contract. So there's, there can be lease components and non lease components in the contract. Simple example the lease of motor vehicle, and there's a, uh, there's a component to do with the payment for maintenance costs as well. Or you lease, it, you lease a shop in a shopping centre and uh, you've got a, you pay for the, the, you know, the rent of the shop and you've got to pay for uh, outcomes. So they're the three questions that you have to ask and assess in determining whether or not you've got a lease. Now in most cases you'll be able to do that intuitively. But there will be some more complex cases where you'll have to go through those considerations to determine whether or not you have a lease. In assessing whether there's an identified asset, a key matter to consider with the new guidance Consideration is whether the lessor has what's referred to as substantive uh, substitution rights. Can they substitute another asset uh, or not? If they if they can substitute another asset, then you don't have a lease. So an example might be uh, um, you you're renting a vehicle from a particular entity. That entity. The vehicle, when it's not in use, goes back to that entity's premises, and that entity can um, determine you can either use that vehicle or another vehicle on the next day because they've got 100 of the same vehicle. You just use it at certain hours each day. If they can substitute the vehicles, then they have substantial substitution rights, particularly if they've stored at their premises. So that's an assessment. Next question is obtaining economic benefits. And uh, what we consider there is whether the customer has the right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from use of the asset throughout its period of use. The economic benefits include the primary outputs and the cash flows from, um, from those capitals. So just, uh, so we're gonna get, I've got a couple of examples here. So, um, in this example, we're talking about retail entities in a contract for lease of a store in a shopping centre for five years. The rental terms include payments equal to 10% of the gross sales revenue generated from the store. And the retailer has the right to determine which products are sold and the design, etc. So the fact that the portion of cash flow that generated from use of the property are passed to those sort is not relevant here. The lessee has the right to 100% um, of sales revenue and is simply paying the, the rental of the store from that cash, those cash flows. So they get substantial economic benefits even though they've got to make payments of rent. Looking at the right to direct the use, what we need to determine is who directs how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use. Is it the customer? The customer's the lessee, if you want. That's, that's uh, jargon that's throughout the standard. The customer. Um, then the contract is the customer that determines how the asset is used. For example, will we, will we use it? Where will we use it? How much output will we produce? Or will we produce output? When will we use it? If the customer or potential lessee uh, makes that, those decisions, then you have a lease. If the supplier, potentially the store, makes those decisions, well then there's no lease. And if it's predetermined because of the nature of the underlying asset arrangements, then you've got to make some further analysis and then give some more detailed guidance on that. In most cases it'll be clear, but sometimes it won't be. Now, 
did mention a moment ago that um, in this stand we have uh, lease agreements, um, which or agreements or contracts which contain both lease and non-lease components. So as a lessee, you've got to determine how you account for those. A lessee has a choice. A lessee can account for the lease components, non-lease components together as one plus one single, single lease contract. If you make that choice though, you end up having a higher right of use asset and a higher lease liability if the payments are captured in determining the lease asset liability. We'll go for an example in a moment if you want to think like that. Lessors don't have that choice. Lessors have to account separately for the uh, lease component and non lease components. I gave an example a moment ago of um, shopping centres, so we'll, we'll run through a couple of examples of that and what the effects of those, of those choices are. It's the best way to show what that requirement standard is, because I'm sure that uh, most of us have property leases and there will be the property leases, a lease, the lease component, lease for the rent building and non lease components, you know, outgoings for um, various expenses, security cleaning, etc. That's why I've uh, picked, I've used these examples to explain this uh, this issue of uh, how you might treat lease components and non lease components. So we're looking at uh, lease of multi unit real estate, so shopping centre or office buildings with various, various firms in the office buildings. They include the common area max costs, uh, which you pay a share of typically, including utility, security, cleaning. These costs uh, may be in the form of how you pay them, maybe a form of percentage rent or fixed fee per square foot or metre, or an estimated instalment of the payments, which compared to the final at the end of the adjustments. It's typical on shopping centres. Um, and as I said, the lessee may elect as a practical expedient by class underlying asset to include the non lease components in the measurement of the liabilities. So if you, you count them separately or include the liabilities, that's a choice that the lessee has. In making this policy choice, let's see should consider whether non lease components would fall within the scope of other variable payments and therefore not be included in measurement of liabilities. Now, I've got two examples. So, a lessee enters into two, two, two leases. For one lease, the common area maintenance costs which are charged as a percentage of rent, they're predetermined over the lease term. There's no comparison to the actual at the end. So the assessment in that case would be that the, um, the common air max costs are fixed. Um, and uh, if lessee elects the practical expedient to include those non lease components in the measurement of the lease lobbies, then those costs are included in the measurement. So the liability, lease, the right use asset, lease liability are higher than if they elected not to include them. And that's what they're saying in the second part of this assessment. Leslie elects not to include the common air range cost in the measurement of the lease lobby, then Leslie would need to determine the split between the rental cost and the common air max costs approximate standalone values. That's because the standard tells us if you're all, you've got um, rent or, and also lease and non-lease components, you have to allocate the, the payments based on the relative standalone sum prices of those. Now as long as the, the payments identified in the lease contract match that, then you're okay, you can use them. If they don't match this relative standalone sum prices, then you've got to do an extra exercise. Hopefully that won't ever happen. In this example, which I think is going to be fairly a lot more common, the common area, common area max cost charged um, uh, is made based on estimate amount. It's then compared actual periodically, and there's a true up. I think that's, uh, that's fairly common in uh, lots of leases that are true up at the end. Now, in this case, the common area, common area max costs are variable in nature. This is getting to the issue of what payments are captured in lease assets and lease liabilities. So they're variable in nature, because, and it says that they're true variability based on the amount of costs that are actually incurred. So regardless of whether the lessee elects to utilise the practical expedient to include those non-lease components in the measurement of the lease liabilities, these common areas of maintenance costs would not be included in the measurement of the lease contract. 
So where the variable, where these costs are variable, whatever choice you make doesn't matter. Because even though um, you may choose to calculate one, because they're variable, they're excluded from the calculation of the lease asset and lease liability because the lease asset and lease liability do not include variable payments. So they're just expense as you go. I assume many of us have those sorts of costs and sorts of leases and deal with those sorts of matters. So hopefully that, that example is, uh, is of some use in, in practice. So looking at the lease term, that's a key decision, the lease term. Because the longer the lease term, the higher the right of use asset, the higher the lease liability. So the standard gives us the definition of the lease term. It's the non-cancelled period, period uh, for which they say the right to use the underlying asset, plus option periods that the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise. So you have to make an assessment of whether it's reason, whether you're reasonably certain to exercise an option period. Standards gives us guidance on that and it tells us that you've got to consider facts and circumstances that create an economic incentive um, to exercise the option to extend the lease for an option not to terminate. And examples of factors we consider are term, and this is, these are given in standard, whether the terms and conditions of option periods how they compare to market rates or compared to expected market rates. Whether we have significant leasehold improvements at the end of the initial term, which are expected to have significant value still at the end of that term to the lessee. Costs of termination at the end of the initial term, such as relocation costs. The importance of the underlying asset, is it a great site <coughs> for the lessee? Is it optimal? All these factors are considered in, in, in assessing the economic incentives as to whether or not we will exercise an option to extend or not terminate. So it's a key question that we have to make. So these are some of the differences from the old stands. So a simple example. Let's see enters into a lease for a building. non cancelled period of three years with a three year option. Reynolds are set market rates anyway, so that's because they set market rates there, they don't incentivize you either way. Um, during and including during the option period. Less installs leasehold improvements at a significant cost and which have a useful life of at least six years. Location is also ideal for less in operations. Or assessment is less in the answer. Lease commencement, the lessee assesses that it's reasonably certain to exercise a renewal option because the leasehold improvements are expected to have significant economic benefit at the, uh, at the end of the initial term. The rentals um, are, will continue to be based on market, so they, they don't, don't push you either way, so there's equilibrium there in terms of your decision making. But the site's expected to continue to be ideal, so you can assess uh, at least uh, six years. At least term will be a critical decision. And, and we will see changes in assessment of lease term, and we're about to go through um, how you deal with changes um, now. One of those changes is the lease term itself. So, in terms of um, this standard, um, it deals with uh, rent, when I say variable payments are not included in, in, in calculating the right of use asset and lease liability. That, the variable payments are captured, but the payments are variable with um, uh, changes in, in, in index or a rate, such as CPI adjustments or market rental reviews. What we don't do though, is we don't try and estimate those up front on day one. We only make adjustments for CPI changes or market rental reviews when the cash flows change. 
you don't have to try and estimate those on day one of release. And when we when those cash flows change as a result of those CPI adjustments for market rental reviews, at that point in time we have an adjustment to the right of this asset and the lease liability to recalculate the liability and adjust the right of this asset by the same amount. But only when the cash flows change. So, an example of that. So, we've got a lease, 10 year lease, $50,000 payable each year. Payments will change with CPI every each two years. This, the incremental buying rate or discount rate is 5%. The journal entry on day one will be quite of asset for 405000 lease lobby, 355000 cash at 50000 That represents the present value of 50000 per annum for the next nine years. Don't put any estimate of changes in those payments in the future into our initial account. It says down here, measuring lease lobby of lessee does not make an estimate how the future change in the CPI will impact the future lease payments. It assumes the initial payment will remain constant. So you only deal with the changes when they occur. No expense of the change in cash flows. So just another point on variable lease payments. So that's CPI adjustments, market revenues. That's how you deal with them. So hopefully you're not trying to factor them in in your estimates up front now. In terms of other variable payments, these are just another simple example to show how they're treated. So the same facts as, as that slide I've just shown you. So the lessees also are making a variable payment for each year of the lease based on turnover, 1% of sales, which is quite common. That 1% of sales amount will, not, will never be calculated as part of the lease asset and lease liability. It's a variable payment that's excluded from those calculations and it's just accounted for each year as you go. Hopefully you're getting the message, not all payments under release and captured can be counted. Some are just expensed as you go, contingent rent. So that's what that, that's all about. This slide, and you are getting all these slides, so this is a good slide which just captured all the possible changes during the lease term. Um, might be a bit hard to read at the back there, but um, the possible changes are um, changes in um, changes in uh, payments because of changes in index or rate that we've dealt with. Um, they, they result in um, an adjustment for right use asset and lease liability. You don't change your discount rate, you just change the payments as, as you go. You might have changes in the assessment of the lease term itself. Again, um, it doesn't affect uh, PL, just adjustment to the right use asset and lease liability, though you do change the discount rate if you have a change in the assessment of the lease term. Now, don't ask me why. I don't know why the standard set is determined. In some cases, you change the discount rate. In some cases, you don't. But uh, they said in that case, you do change the discount rate. Whereas with a change in the uh, CPI or a change in the market rent, market, uh, the rate of payment for the market rent review, you don't change your discount rate from day one. There are other types of changes you might have during the lease term. For example, you might uh, decrease the scope of the lease. So you've got a lease where you've got two floors in the building, for some reason you um, only require one floor. So you, you reach an agreement with the landlord that, um, to adjust the lease. That's the decrease in scope. The standard tells us how to deal with that as well. Um, and you might have an increase in scope. So you might, you might have two floors and, um, and uh, rent an extra floor. The standard also tells us how to deal with that. Um, and it may be simply counted for as a separate release if there's uh, if the payments for that extra floor are based on um, standalone sales price or standalone prices. So standard goes through a whole bunch of uh, uh, deals with all these possible modifications and the measurement of these estimates. One of the key issues you're going to have to deal with in terms of uh, this standard in your accounting is what discount rate do you apply in, uh, in calculating the uh, lease liability, which affects the right lease asset. Standard tells us that uh, use the interest rate implicit in the lease. 
first instance. However, if you can't determine that, then you use the incremental borrowing rate, a less easy incremental borrowing rate. In many leases, of course, you won't be able to determine the interest rate of this single lease. For example, leases of buildings, typically you won't know the no, they won't know the inputs to determine the interest rate of this in the lease. You may be able to determine that for motor vehicles, historically you've been able to, uh, but uh, in terms of the, uh, the lease of a building, for example, it's virtually impossible to work that out. So you'll end up using the incremental borrowing rate in many cases. Standard gives us a definition of the incremental borrowing rate, it tells us that it's a rate that the lessee will have to pay to borrow a similar, over a similar term. So, what's the term of the lease? Five years, is it ten years, is it twenty years? So, the term affects the uh, rate. Because typically, the longer the term, the higher the rate. With a similar security, there's different types of um, rights of use assets may, may give different uh, impacts on the, uh, on the, on the uh, impact of security. Funds that are to, to necessarily contain an asset of similar value. Um, to the right of use asset in a similar economic environment. So you know, the rate in Australia would be different to the rate in, in Indonesia, for example, with the discount rate. The impact of this is that the incremental borrowing rate will not be necessarily the same for all leases that LSE has. Because it takes into account the term, the particular security or right of use asset, and the value. So you might find that you have a number of different incremental borrowing rates in your total lease portfolio. This slide just gives a, a methodology um, that you may consider in, in trying to come up with the incremental borrowing rate. You might look at a uh, base rate, you know, risk-free rate based on the economic environment and the term of the lease and the, and the value that you're borrowing. Then add in financing factors specific to the SE and the combination of these two might simply be what could you borrow unsecured for that term for that for that value effectively. Then you take into account factors relevant to the asset and, and what reduction in that rate that you can borrow that unsecured, what reduction can you get in that in that rate based on the on the security of that asset. That's just a, a methodology that can be used. That's commented on in our publication. It goes into more detail on that if you're interested. So that's a high level. Thing. Yes, okay. just on the interest rates. I'm just reflecting that if you have a lease that goes through five years, that's probably okay. If you've got one that goes ten, banks won't lend on ten. Well, most people won't lend on ten. Or if they do, <coughs> have a run of the reset margins and those sorts of things after a few years. So I'm just wondering, is there a potential um, way that you can <coughs> sort of try and apply the requirements of the standard? Because um, you know, there's very few lenders now that will go beyond three years <coughs> for loan time uh, without resetting everything. Um, I'm not sure there's <coughs> a practical way uh, yeah. of doing that. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we have to look at um, <coughs> we have to take the term into account in setting the discount rate, so somehow we have to address that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure of a simple practical way of doing it. I mean, it's easy to write. So it's it is. I it's not to really it's easy to write, but I've just noticed yeah. that yeah. Um, you know, banks are trying to narrow the terms. Yeah. If you could, you could probably get the base rate for a long term. What you're talking about is, is the difficult one, is the rate specific to the audit that. It's true that it's the lessee specific factors that is the difficult one to talk about because you can probably get a base rate from um, from using bonds or you know government bonds or that's the risk free type rate. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect the security or sorry the uh, you know the credit risk of the lessee. You're talking about the credit risk of the lessee. Well, the banks tend to do you know, the bank bill rate, swap rate, so that's a base rate. Yeah. That moves, of course, plus the margin. Yeah, it's the margin. So they'll, they'll, they'll change the margin every three years. It's Ten years, um, as I said, the, the, the 
rights do tend to vary. Yeah. No, I don't want to go to one place. Thanks, my question. Just someone might. Um, so, similar question, I suppose, but if your bank you're using a bank lending rate and they have said that, that you have a variable interest rate or does this specific like you said it has to be unsecured but it, does it have to be fixed? Well it's actually the right actually reflects the, the um, security of the Arthritis asset so that's this uh, that's this part of the methodology um, um, but uh, it's, the, it's the right to return so it can't not going to use a variable rate. So it's a rate for return, and that's the definition we're dealing with here. Um, uh, there's still not term. So somehow that's what we're going to get. Well, it's not a big one I'm worried about, it's not a simple exercise. In some cases, we've got a lot of big portfolio. If you've only got a small, well, a small portfolio, at least, it may not, you might be able to do some sensitivities, and it may not really matter that much. Um, whether you know it's adjusted up or down by a bit, you know, depending on the size of your portfolio. Obviously, the larger the you know, least portfolio, the more important it becomes. So you might be able to run some sensitivity and say, well, focus on our least portfolio. One percent moon and all the way doesn't matter, and that's the maximum I could move. So we're happy with that range. But that would be how I'd be um, trying to you know, factor it in. And if, if you've got a large portfolio, then I don't know whether this is relevant, Clark. Obviously, the, the biggest dollar value effect in this will be around property leasing, so leasing premises. So I don't know to what extent um, borrowing rates that are secured by property potentially give you a guide where to go. Um, but also... Remember, we're, we can only use the right use asset, though, not the underlying... Yeah, it's understand that. The, uh, yeah, I understand that. The other thing to keep in mind too is that there are all the listed entities uh, applying this same standard and whether they might then be disclosing in their key judgments or in their accounts assumptions made around this which sort of helps guide you okay from a benchmark. Yes. From a benchmark, that's right. Um, you would have to align as an entity though and assess your credit yeah, on the yeah. find some number So that's just a very high level issue. And what I'll try to cover there is a range of issues, practical issues that we're going to have to deal with in this standard, particularly this year with transition, um, as they see. Just, just some quick uh, commentary on lessor accounting, which is uh, far less impacted as compared to lessee accounting. So um, in most respects, lessors this all counting is much the same. We still have to assess whether we've got an operating list of finances, so that dual model is still there. There might be some impacts at margin in some cases because of the new definition of lease, the definition of lease payments, and I'm trying to give some examples of how variable lease payments are treated here. Some are included in the calculation of lease asset, lease liability, right use asset, I'm sorry, and the lease liability, whereas other variable payments are excluded. The new guidance um, around subleases, where um, you, um, where an uh, entity enters into a head lease and enters into a sublease, think right franchise orders, and we, we've got a few clients that are in that situation. So the new guidance there, typically um, we're talking about franchise orders, for example, we're talking about um, the franchise order enters into a head lease for the premises and, um, with, with the landlord, then it is into a sublease with the franchisee. Typically, we're matching terms, back to back terms. So, the new guidance there um, is that in assessing whether you've got a finance lease or an operating lease um, from a franchise or specifically called a sub lease, um, that decision is made with regard to the right of use asset, not the underlying asset, which is owned by the landlord. So, if you've got a, lease, a sub lease with terms that match the head lease, the decision will be that it is a finance lease, not an operating lease. 
So, because historically, the French was organized saw the circumstances would have operated this on both sides and would not have uh, accounted for anything on Belgium. So going forward, a franchisor in that circumstance will be recognising a lease receivable and a lease liability, lease income, lease expense, clients and other on lease expense. Now some people might say, well, I don't accept those things as well. Um, the standard set has thought about that and said no. Dig into the basic conclusions of the will be grossing up of the uh, balance sheet for franchise laws, for example, or anyone else in a similar situation, and also the debt of the uh, gross up, showing the more income and more expense. And that's, uh, that's essentially what that example uh, goes through. Thank you. 
transmission, particularly in our product clients, because they're not so concerned about the uh, the, um, you know, the depreciation expense the impact. That's the that's the negative of that method is that it's got a higher post transition expense. Um, if you can work out, it's not going to be that much different. So I'd be going to buy by one, but. I was thinking it through while you were presenting Clark and going back to that example that's in those slides there. And I think certainly where you've got leases that are relatively new, large property leases or whatever, it might even only be halfway through those, I'd expect that option one would result in a higher depreciation expense. You'd have a higher asset when you're actually matching your, your, your asset um, to your liability. I'd imagine as you get through and your interest expense is less and you're chewing up more of that principal, so you've got um, property leases might be closer to the end of their term, then that might be less of an issue and therefore option one won't have so much of a, a negative P&L impact um, going forward. But I think like Clark says, it is a bit of, you've got to run the numbers a bit to, to understand. No, uh, so could be a list of this. Yeah. Since been in a three year lease and we're in the last six months of that lease, could we classify that as like less than 12 months left? Do we have to do anything with um, that lease? If, if, uh, if there's reasonably certain, you're not reasonably certain of exercises, an option, so there's no, there's no option, and you're likely to, for example, go somewhere else. Um, and, and the practical experience that you might have out there, um, unfortunately, was, was available to you. That's only available if you use the modified method. Um, then you may be able to do that. Just expand on that a bit. Something the auditor is going to look for when they come and look at your calculations around this is really that judgment around well, are you likely to exercise those options? So this is certainly one of those instances where if you can pull out a paper to sit under your auditor's nose and say, these are the factors that we've considered in arriving at that decision is gonna save a lot of time for, for everyone. So Clark had it up in, in the slides there before, but things that you might wanna document in that paper, your fit out costs. So either we've got a lot of fit out costs or we don't have much fit out costs. And that's gonna weigh up whether you like it, exercise your options. Whether there's some really favorable terms under that lease um, that would mean you are likely to exercise those options. Or no, it's at market, so it doesn't really matter one way or the other. Um, and then probably the other key one is, it, is that location a real advantage to you or, or not? Um, and document those decisions uh, or those factors to then say, well, are we likely to exercise or not? So I think having that documented um, is gonna make the discussions at audit time uh, a lot easier. And similarly, the other big judgment will obviously be that um, incremental borrowing rate. And I can imagine you all scratching your heads and saying, how are we going to come up with that? My advice as the practical auditor is keep materiality in mind. I think Clark was spot on when saying, okay, well, if you don't have a lot of leases and whatever, impact not, may not be material, do a bit of sensitivity um, analysis. Um, uh, and I think look at what others are doing. Like it's not uncommon to look at some of these public companies that go early and they've already put their information out, already applied this in a similar industry, renting similar properties. Well, what are they doing? I know it is on a by entity by entity basis, but I don't think we're going to be talking about 10% difference or even, I don't know, maybe 5% difference. That might be your, your sensitivity. So big, they're the practical elements, I think. Yeah,